and thank you for joining. Uh, welcome to the third episode of Wisdom Talks, Chat GPT versus Spiritual Guides. I am Trisha and I will be your host for today. I am a London-based marketing and events manager, born and brought up in India. I've been living in the UK since I was 18 and have completed my master's in innovation and technology management whilst living here. The link between technology and spirituality is very personal to me and a lot of us um, who work and live in the modern world. So I'm really excited to welcome our speakers for today. Dr. Jaisal Bankanya and Rajiv Nanda. Dr. Jaisal, his wife and two children live in rugby. He is a dental implant surgeon, as well as a lecturer of dentistry at the University of Birmingham. Spiritually, he has grown up in the Bhakti Yoga tradition and has over 40 years of experience in the lifestyle. Um, his spiritual master, J. Pataka Swami, named him J. Subal Balram Das, which means the servant of spiritual strength. Rajiv Nanda heads up the Thinkita project and is the main, main man behind Keshava Swami's vision. He also takes part in various other initiatives for young professionals, speaking regularly at events. He is also a key leader in fundraising and supporting Food for Life London, an initiative feeding thousands of hot meals per week to the homeless. Food for Life London is primarily run by young professionals in the city who volunteer after work. He is the GP pharmacist as well as a well-being strat strategist. He is also a speaker for the NHS. He specializes in doing well-being workshops that focus around mental health, anxiety, resilience, finding purpose, and also team building. A popular offering in his guided meditation are his guided meditations and breath work, now regularly practiced by NHS staff. Rajiv is a dynamic spiritual speaker, teaching Vedic philosophy to large audiences. He presents the knowledge in, and in a practical and applicable way, uh, in a way that we can incorporate in our daily lives. So today's plan is that we'll start with a few questions that I have uh, about today's topic, and then we'll also have some questions from the audience. We've reserved some time. So please send in your questions in the Q&A tab. If you have any issues in connecting, please put them in the chat as well, and we will try and help you. So without further ado, let's get into today's session. So my first question I'm going to address to Dr. Jaisal, who is Balram. Um, so Balram, I would like to ask you, what is the relationship between technology, materialism and spirituality? Do they complement or hinder one another? Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for a lovely introduction, Trisha. And, uh, I just want to first of all before i answer your question is just acknowledge some of the people that i can see on my zoom screen if, if that's okay i can see some people that i recognize sushma she's waving at me i can see Minnow doing something in the kitchen i can see gaurav hello gaurav and dr sachdev i recognize kiran as well so i just it's nice to just um see everyone there um and yeah if you want to wave then please feel free to wave uh so okay so your question Sorry, Tricia, just a bit of a side note there. You, you're asking me, um, is com, can technology be complementary or contradictory to spiritual life? This, this is a question. Yeah, so it's just technology is fairly new when it comes to just the history of life and humanity. Um, spirituality in a lot of ways, at least when it comes to modern technology, spirituality goes a lot further back. So since... Mm modern technology has become a part of our lives, how does that affect our relationship with spirituality, especially for those of us who were born into this very rapid technological era? Yeah, no, so that, yeah, okay. So I've got a, I've got a, a 12 year old and a 13 year old. And so for me, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot that actually generation Z and generation A this technology is just an extension of their consciousness whereas at least i've seen it kind of come i know a time without it 
and almost I have to artificially create time without technology for them. Whereas it, it was the other way around when I was a kid. So yeah, how, how do we negotiate, you know, get negotiate that? How do we navigate that? Um, so I would say that technology is certainly a tool and um, any tool we, we should just understand is neutral. That would be the thing that I say about technology. So for example, like a knife is a very early piece of technology, right? So obviously in my hand as a surgeon, I, I do things for patients, right? So in the surgeon's hand, my knife um, is, is useful. Uh, whereas obviously in the wrong hands, the technology of a knife is, is you know, maleficent, should we say, it's, it's, it's bad. Um, so in that way, we, if we think about technology as basically as that, then it depends on whose hand it's in and it depends on what it's being used for. So that would be the first kind of thing I would say. What do you think about that? No, yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, what, would, what would you say to the idea that while all tools are neutral, it really is, it depends on who's holding it, do some tools automatically or the lack of having them bring us or keep us closer to our true nature. For example, technology takes us away from being outside in nature. So it's useful and it helps us in a lot of ways, but does it innately take us away from something spiritual or not? Is, are we, is, it, is it genuinely totally neutral in that sense? So let's just take this evening, for example, this one hour that I'm spending with you and all the other guys we are brought together by this piece of technology, but I'm, it's, that's one hour away from my kids, right? So in, in that sense, it's like, well, what's, what's really important is obviously to be with my kids and connected to my family. And, you know, I've got a nice garden. I could sit in there. You've got some nice plants behind you. So yeah, it's like, is it moving me away from that? I mean, because we're talking about something to do with wisdom i'm happy to give that time but yes my device like i've got my device right here and yes i do catch myself just distracted i'm sure everyone does it's it's uh, it's easily done um but i think that's where regulation is important and that's what spirituality one of the first kind of pillars of spirituality especially in the bhakti tradition is self-mastery self-regulation um is part of what we call dharma the one of the pillars of dharma is um, especially what's called tapas, which is like a fire of regulation. Uh, and actually, yeah, sometimes I do need to just sometimes delete my apps, social media apps, just to regulate myself, maybe do it for a month or even two months, just so I don't do anything. I don't know if anyone else does stuff like that. Um, but I think being aware, I think spirituality is awareness. So then knowing when something is overriding our well-being or even our connection to other people or or nature as you say or you mm -hmm. know doing something like that so i know there's artificial apps where you can just have like the rain falling and then you could close your eyes and be in this tranquil place and sometimes we do need that let's be honest but there's no, nothing beats going and actually doing that so yeah certainly it's, it's a tool yeah okay that's really interesting and you did mention so being a parent and perhaps having a childhood before everything was taken over by screens gives you the ability or the reference to know how to regulate yourself. What advice yeah. would you give to someone who's around the age of 20 or 18 who doesn't have a reference prior to technology um, and might not even realize when they need that time other than from like an external perspective and that's just being told from other people so what advice would you give to people in that situation mm. yeah it's almost like if i try and work that out there was a time where say my my father or my grandfather would say well there was a time where there were no cars or there was one car for the mm -hmm. whole family and i almost don't understand that reality so in some ways it's it's almost um redundant to say there was a time when there was nothing like that so i can understand that point of view um but then actually yeah maybe taking account so what i do i just say what i do practically with my kids um i know you said about a 20 year old they're not quite there yet but let them become self-aware so if they i just sometimes they're on screen for too long and then like you can see it in their eyes like they're, they're just 
zoned out, they're irritable and all that, and they just get them aware, just like, okay, how irritated are you at the minute? Do you need a bit of time? Do you need a bit of time out? Uh, you know, what's happening? And then they become a bit more aware of, okay, yeah, I went on screen for quite a long time. Um, so for, you know, that, that self-awareness and self-regulation, I think has got to come from an early age. And then say so if you're in your twenties and I do, I teach, um, 18 to 23 year olds cause I teach dentistry. And again, everything is on like the lectures are on the screen. Now we're asking them to watch videos of procedures and then, you know, so there is something built into the curriculum as well of, you know, just getting out there every 20 minutes, looking in the distance, you know, little things like this, little tips and tricks, but I think it comes down to awareness and knowing when to switch off. Um, and maybe even artificially going back to like the 1990s or 1980s and just go, right, I'm going to only turn my Wi-Fi on <laughs> at a certain time in the day, just to check in with, with this reality. Uh, just even as an experiment that I'd probably say for mm -hmm. someone in their twenties to do. I mean, what, how do you feel about that? Is that realistic? I don't know if you do something like that anyway. Yeah, totally. Um, but I wouldn't say I was necessarily born at a time where um, I would, my life was overtaken by screens. Um, so mm -hmm. maybe I was just at that cusp, but I totally <laughs> know what you mean. And I think a lot of people from experience have similar practices, which is to find ways to limit their screen time from mm -hmm. their own experience and self-reflection, like you mentioned about your kids. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to have to embrace it. I, in fact, my wife was saying this the other day, screens are here to stay and actually, um, everything is done on the screen from their tuition mm -hmm. to if we say to read something my daughter will mm -hmm. look on her kindle so they're here to stay we we can't fight it um and you know technology the sanskrit word yantra means machine um so yeah. technology is there so we are a yantra heavily yantra based era at the minute and, and we just got to accept it and just know when to log out log off yeah 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 that's interesting that you said the word yantra because now you mentioned sanskrit so the word probably goes very far back probably goes far back beyond screens and beyond what we currently consider technology so in the east yoga and mindfulness have always been considered technologies for inner well-being um what, what are your views on that? Do you think that spirituality or having a spiritual practice is something tangible, a technology that we can rely on a practice for inner well-being, um, whatever the goal may be? Um, or is it something more ethereal, less tangible and something we shouldn't necessarily try and understand intellectually? Hmm. OK. There's a lot packed in that question. So I'll, I'll start speaking and if I go off track like a, like a lecturer does and just bring you back on track, I'll just go, go to the beginning of your question, which is about age old technologies. Now, if we just think about buildings and gardens and everything in the mm -hmm. shape of them, they were based on Yantra, which was based on sound. So nowadays um, you can have these things called tonoscopes where you vibrate sound onto sand and if a certain pitch creates a certain geometric shape mm -hmm. so this is how we get our yantras so actually the gardens of thousand years of years ago were based on like small model versions of this so these so there's almost like in, in nature these yantras were put in these gardens and these um the size of your room and all these things that they're, they're there okay whether we um believe it or not uh, there, is, there is some technology that's lost, okay? So mm -hmm. we, we maybe don't see that. Um, so that would be the first thing I'd say. Um, and then that actually then relates to the inner uh, world, as inner engineering as well. So we've got the external engineering, which is based on something. But even if you go to, like there's there's a place nearby, Coombe Abbey it's called. There's a beautiful abbey. Um, you know, the monks used to live there. Uh, hundreds of years ago and if you go into those gardens they're like the trees are just like in a perfect line <laughs> about four rows of trees the gardens of ge geometry and everything so even if we create something um which has some sort of base some sort of basis mm -hmm. i think that's what we're looking for always 
we want something that's got a solid base so um and there's a pattern to it it's where where structure and chaos come and then you've got creativity in the middle so if we always do that and that's just a an age-old thing and it's innate within us like we create our rooms in that way like you've got nice plants there and then your shelves serve a purpose and all those things so if we keep that together and then we think okay well that's me in harmony with my external world and then how do i have harmony in my internal world that's then you know, this way yantra tantra and mantra all come together and that's an age old philosophy and i think that's applicable still now did i go off track or was that did i have no, no that definitely answers the question but i'll just dig a little deeper there so would so you would say that there is a tangible aspect to having a spiritual practice and being technologically minded in the modern day um, doesn't in any way mean we cannot be spiritually minded because spirituality is based on something. It has a basis and potentially at this point in time, it's slightly difficult for us to understand that basis. Mm, okay, I see. I see your point with the tangible versus the ethereal that's what you said isn't it in your yeah question. it's so, not like science yeah. based and we are quite intellectually focused as society and most of our modern lives at least we try and we claim is scientifically based and rooted in logic yeah so um what i would first of all say is so we just paused a second is that my screen or can you still see me? Sushma, give me a wave. You're still there. Yeah, okay, you can still see me. The, the, the screen's paused a little bit. Um, so I would say that um, we want um, tangible... I think we might have lost Trisha. Sorry. Oh, no, I'm here. Am I not audible still? Yeah, okay, you're there. I can hear you now. Yeah, I'm right here, yes. Uh, there you go. Let me spotlight you again. Okay. Okay. You're, you're back. I, I lost you for a second there. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Did I finish my lost question? You, lost you into the ether. Lost you into the <laughs> ether. Okay. So, um, yeah, we are looking for something tangible, but let me just define spiritual and material. And then there's a bit in between as well. So there's the physical and the material. That's the tan tangible. And then there's the metaphysical then, which is right. the subtle. Okay. But everything, everything metaphysical is not spiritual. So, okay, so okay. this is one misconception, right? So we've got some parts of the metaphysical which aren't quite spiritual, like the level of, if I think about ourselves, right? We have, the, we have a physicality, then we have a physiology. So that's still a bit physical, but it's less visible. Then we have a psychology. So that's not really visible. It's metaphysical, but it's not quite spiritual. So we have a we have a physical self, a physiological self, we have a psychological self, and then we also have a philosophical self, which is even below the psychological self. And that still is not spiritual. Those are still material, but subtle, or we can say metaphysical. So sometimes there's a misconception that um, shamanic traditions or even things that have they are valid, like aura, cleansing, Reiki, you know, subtle things, even going to a psychologist, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, all these things, they're subtle, but they're not quite spiritual. So then mm -hmm. it's like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to define what is tangible. You asked me what's tangible and tangible is, yeah, I can see this physically changes, right? That's, I can see that, but some things are felt. Right. And then spirit, which is life itself, is something so, so subtle, even more subtle than your beliefs that sometimes you, we don't even know what our beliefs are until they're challenged. So it's even more subtle than that. So, again, it's this is what the ancient yoga system is. So th this this word D, this word D means like divinity, which means the ability to see in one's mind. Is basically um the ashtanga yoga process wants us to get to this state called samadhi total absorption in that attention so we go through all these eight stages 
we've got the yamas and the niyamas first of all the observances and the restrictions right and then we have these physical postures to get our body doing something and then we have breath work pranayam and all this is doing is taking our attention out from the external world into the internal world and then we have dhyan dharana yeah so we're holding our attention now inside so this this ashtanga yoga process is one process of yoga and it's basically dhyan dhyan means attention and our attention is what is going into this tech in fact our attention is the biggest commodity that every single business however old it's been is trying to get whether it be adverts uh, whether it be you know adverts from newspapers in the 1920s to adverts in the 60s and 70s and then all the way youtube now and then these little quick ads that come before our videos it's all to grab our attention our attention is our biggest commodity so the engineering of yoga is to like the, the analogy is given of the turtle or tortoise that is bringing its limbs from the external world inside is to bring that attention in and then just become more aware that's like the first first bit so that that you can feel that is tangible that is tangible but it's tangible inside is that is that okay talking about yeah. the tangible yeah ethereum? that only answers the question um that makes me think um and rajiv i'll point this question to you um when it comes to having these internal technologies and these external technologies, it seems like we would have sufficient ways um, to guide ourselves. So enough, enough compasses within to um, tell us which way we need to go. So when we have, we've always had ourselves, but now we've got AI, we have such rapid access to information. So what are your views on having a guru, having a spiritual teacher, when we have instant access to even the information that Balram has said, to just listen to it from an outsider's perspective? We have that. Everyone has that now. Um, so, yeah, especially with your personal experience, what is the role of a guru when we have so much access to information? Thank you, Trisha. Thank you for, for hosting this and um, doing such a nice job. And thank you, uh, Jasso, for being on as well. So good to see you both. And thank you, everyone, for joining. It's so, so happy you all guys are here and, and sharing nice wisdom with us. And um, yeah, thank you for your question, Trisha. Um, I was just thinking, you know, you were talking about the tangible and, you know, is spirituality tangible or not? You know, I think this is a good question, especially for the for the youth, you know, like um, I, and a lot of people, a lot of times we get this question. And uh, see, I come from a science background and for me, it's always like, OK, how is this scientific? So the first thing is, OK, there's a hypothesis. Every science experiment has a hypothesis. Right. So what is that hypothesis? So in spirituality, like what is the, the question? What are we defining? And that's who we are who is god why are we here and how can we connect so that's like four general basic questions which we learn from something called shastra so balaram was talking about like mantras and uh, ways and, and and knowledge and that's shastra so you get the hypothesis from the shastra and then how do you tangibly experience this so then you get that as a experiment so you get an experiment right so the shastra tells you what that experiment is okay so how do you practically then apply what knowledge that you've got now these two things are important and i'll, and I'll get to your question in a second about how does the guru come into this or the spiritual guide come into this once you have the shastra then you have the sadhana which is the experiment um but that's basically you know practicing practicing what you're doing um and then we can tangibly like with both these things both both having the shastra both practicing then you can experience the divinity so then you basically start to experience things that you might not have experienced before um and and that's how that's how the the process works so you know like 
um, like Balam was saying, it's an internal thing, but actually there is a process to it. There's knowledge that you have to acquire, which is hypothesis, and then sadhana that you have to practice, which gives you the conclusion. So that gives you the perfection. Now, this question you asked me, like, okay, so you've got technology giving you all the answers, but then you've got um, like practical spiritual guides there. So how do we, like, you know, do we need them anymore? Um, yeah, like, I don't know if the, there was this film that came out recently. It was, it was based on the Ramayan. And maybe some of you might have heard of it, actually. And uh, what they did with this film was they literally, like, um, advertised it as, you know, this is such a great movie. Ramayan is like an, like an old Indian classic. Um, it's got a lot of deep wisdom in it. So they made this movie. But what they forgot to do is actually um, read the Ramayan, actually read the story, actually get the heart of the story. It was pretty much like they just copy pasted the script from different aspects of the internet. And I didn't actually, I actually put the film on with my niece, like for like five minutes and I watched the first five minutes and I was like, oh, this is completely wrong. Like it doesn't seem, um, you know, chronologically correct. It, it was really off. And, and, and if you can see some reviews about it, and basically, they just copy pasted everything into one thing. Now, if you look at the Ramayana, it's such a beautiful literature, it's such a beautiful epic. You can understand so much points from it, so much wisdom. But they had got it wrong because they just copy pasted it. They didn't actually understand the heart of it. So it's the same with um, us having spiritual guides and spiritual wisdom. It's not something that AI can really generate, or you can really, you know, you can really. Um, create you have to kind of understand the heart of something basically to make it and and that's what spirituality is because yeah that's it, it's about understanding the heart um i'll stop there because because there's that do you want to ask, ask any further questions on that um, uh, um so if i'm if i understand you correctly um and it makes a lot of sense is that while a spiritual guru might impart knowledge, like intellectual knowledge, what they're really trying to make you understand is the essence. And that's, that can come in different ways. While information on an intellectual level only comes in one way and you can totally miss the essence if you just copy paste, even the facts correctly, you could still miss the essence. Yeah, when we say essence, we mean the heart. Mm -hmm. you know, like it's the heart of the story. It's the heart, it's the nuances, it's the, emotion um you know like like you can define um you know three categories that we've been talking about one is technology which is the external and uh, then you've got the internal you know so, so the psychological um so the external is something that, which is technology is so like you can utilize the technology it can go vastly um you know it grows vastly you connect with it you interface with it so that's the external uh, nature you're dealing with and then you have the psychological. So then you're dealing with, okay, the mind dealing with this technology, the materialism, the use of the technology, how you're interfacing with it. But beyond that is the spiritual. So the spiritual is, is what's driving it, what's driving your interaction with both the material and the, um, the, the mind, the interface of it, and actually also the, you know, the external of it. Now, AI can guide you with the external and maybe to some level it can give you about, you know, emotional intelligence. But what it lacks is the ability to understand consciousness. So if we don't understand consciousness, our connection with the soul, our eternal connection with the soul, our eternal connection with the heart, our connection with the divinity, then we don't, then we're going to miss, miss that true essence of of what we're doing and and what spirituality does is connects it's about connecting with the source with connecting to that root um you know in vedic times they use this analogy of watering the root of the tree so when you water the root of the tree when you water um by connecting to spirituality you actually you know you actually then nourish the rest of the tree so like that you kind of think saying like okay how does a how does a spiritual guide come into your life 
And once they're rolled, so their role is to water that nourishment of your soul um, rather than watering, you know, the mind or watering the externals, you know, that you're, you know, whatever you're interfacing with. No, it actually gets to watering the soul. And then this, and as you, like the analogy goes, you water the tree, it then affects the rest of the uh, rest of the tree and nourishes everything else. So, Okay, yeah. So that totally makes sense. And as Balram was saying as well, what we're talking about is the subtlest of bodies, the hardest to objectify and quantify, something that's totally internal. Um, and currently, when we talk about internal, we go as far as maybe our value system or our psychology. Um, it's hard for us to um, yeah, just quantify anything subtler than that. Also, because I, I guess it is it is beyond words. Not only is it hard to um, understand, even if it was understandable, it would still be hard to put into words. So there was this, um, there was a guru, like I think it's Kesha Swami's spiritual master. And um, somebody asked him, like, have you seen God? Have you seen God face to face? And he said, um, no, I haven't seen God face to face, but I've seen the hand of God many times. So, you know, like you can't, it's not something maybe you might not see tangibly, but actually it's something you experience. Yeah. And also it's something that I guess is, is everywhere all the time um, is also part of it. Um, it's just a, it's a matter of, perception more than a matter of existence mm. um, yeah. so Rajiv you were saying um, you were talking about these internal technologies we're talking about information and what what gets lost in translation when we move from a, a real a teacher a spiritual teacher and I know especially in Sanskrit and Hindi there's many words for teachers and guru is one of them and if i'm correct don't hold me to this guru means the one who brings light into darkness so the one who sheds light um so i understand that that it's subtle and very hard to discuss but what is that heart you mentioned the word consciousness so with the lack of language, how would you describe the aspect that a guru influences? What is this consciousness that we speak of? Yeah, consciousness uh, comes down. Uh, uh, well, there's a nice analogy given in uh, the Bhagavad Gita, and it's the analogy of the chariot. So you see, you have like, if anybody has a copy of the Gita, there's a nice picture in there. I don't know where my copy is gone. I usually have it on my desk. Um, if you open up the Gita, there's a nice picture in there and it shows you a picture of a chariot and it describes that the senses are like horses in the chariot. The mind is like the rain. The driver of the chariot is the intelligence and behind the intelligence is the soul, who's the passenger, who is directing the intelligence on where to go and how to go. So the soul is described in this analogy. And actually, there's a verse in the Gita, which actually, it talks about it hierarchy, like in terms of hierarchy as well. I think it's verse 4.3.42. So you got uh, anyone with the Gita, they can look at that. And it says the working senses are superior to dull matter. The mind is higher than the senses. And then intelligence is still higher than the mind. And he which talks about the soul is even higher than the intelligence. So it's giving this like hierarchy of uh, analysis. So when we define consciousness, we're, de we're defining the, the soul, which is in Vedic times, in Vedic literature is described as full of knowledge, full of eternal and full of bliss. So actually we all have an individual soul. We all have an individual um, spark that keeps us keeps this body alive that's different from matter and the soul is interfacing with that so basically what the guru does is it connects you basically helps you identify with your soul how like 
it identifies it helps you constantly identify with your soul because um without that knowledge you're kind of going to still feel like you're this body or you're this job or you're this um you know a lot of things people can think they are or you're, that they're defined by you know you're or, or this gender or you're this age or but actually that's the external actually what we're looking at is the consciousness which is which is the soul is that what you were asking trisha like the yes. Yes, I, I understand what you're saying. I totally do. Um, but you answered my question perfectly. Um, just for someone who's who doesn't have a lot of experience spiritually, um, you said we all have a soul. And ideally, that's what we should identify with. Um, I know in yogic tradition, we have practices. So understanding that you're a soul, not the body or the mind, all these things we identify with, that's a process. Um, that's a that's a gift we get, a reward at the end of a process, maybe. So for someone who doesn't have any inclination to think that way, um, what does it mean that I am not my body and I am not my mind? And how could I even begin to bring that into my life as a reality and of course Balram like feel free to answer this as well yeah so like so somebody that's not really connected to the like spirituality and doesn't understand the concept of soul so like we can look at it in a few ways one is so if you look at it uh, logically okay you can see like when somebody dies um, they go from being conscious to unconscious. Um, you see, like, even terminology, you use words like they pass away or, you know, they've moved on. So in that sense, yeah, you can see that, okay, this person is is now just matter. It's, it's, he's not conscious. So philosophically, you can understand that. Then, actually, you can understand it by your identity, so you've if you narrow down what is your true identity and what's not changeable so actually your body changes your body changes every i think it's every seven years you're whole, you're a completely different person so you can't be your body um your mind you you have your mind which can also um, degrade and what you knew before 10 years ago you probably don't know now so your mind has evolved as well um so if you look at it logically, actually, yeah, it's 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 the change. But then, okay, how do you then practically experience it? So like I was talking about, experimentally. So doing things like meditation, yoga, connecting to spirituality, uh, connecting with something that's of a higher consciousness. You have to, you can also experience these things. Um, so yeah, you can experience your soul like you know, through meditation um but yeah it takes time it, it does take time but you can experience it um and uh and our, actually our nature is to be blissful you know like our, our default is to be blissful so when you were a child when you didn't have so much worries and so much things going on you were happy and you were like generally in, in a more positive state so balram maybe you can you can add some some points to that um yeah sorry my mind is like going crazy because <laughs> i've I'm, i've got some things on ai to talk about and then guru and then what you've been saying here so uh i just when you guys asked me to come onto this podcast i thought i would ask chat gpt if it would be my spiritual master right so i said i said chat gpt will you be my spiritual master and it said i can provide information and insights on a wide range of spiritual topics but I'm not a replacement for a dedicated spiritual teacher or guide. <laughs> if you have questions or want to explore spiritual concepts, feel free to ask. That was just something that I, I did earlier. I thought I would share that. So what AI does, obviously A means artificial, right? So it's it's a library and it's a technology that's fused. So we, we it will give us so much. It really, really will. But what uh, Raj was saying is that the essence, the essence is the essence of consciousness is free will, right? So AI doesn't exert any free will uh, yet, um, but it doesn't have this capacity to to think like that. So that's the missing bit. So it's the um, it has 
we can say a mind or a memory and it has some sort of intellect because certain chat GPTs will always end uh, in a beneficial way. So even if you put something negative into chat GPT, it will come out and give a conclusive thing, say, although I've said all these things, people want to be positive, yada, yada, yada. But there, there could be some AI that's made, which is um, maleficent, which then is, is dangerous, how to manipulate, how to exploit all these things. So we need to be wary of that. And then it goes on to the idea of guru. And then guru means like heavy, someone who's got gravitas, someone who's got depth. So it's, it's knowledge, but also you say, Trisha, when you said to be able to see divinity everywhere, that is what the job of the guru is. Um, and, and actually the dependency on seeing or finding a guru is dependent on the student. The more we decide to be a student, the more we will see, um, guru everywhere. So with the more we'll see divinity, uh, or God's hand everywhere. And, and you were saying something about terms. So like, if I just say, okay, we've got this English terms like teacher, guide, advisor, mentor, coach, all of these things. But in Sanskrit, we have um, Acharya, we have Vidya, we have um, Guru, uh, we have Shiksha Guru, we have Diksha Guru, we have what's called Varnatham Prataksh Guru, we have Chaitya Guru. So it's like the, the Guru that's inside us, or like even the tree could become a, a Guru, could become a teacher. So if we can broaden our mind to um, take in information and see every person, everything as a life lesson, then every situation becomes te like a teacher to us. And we, therefore the, we grow. Uh, it's like when Keshav Maharaj was saying, I don't, you probably have been in it where, been in his lectures where he's saying that actually age and wisdom grow at the same rate up to age 25 let's say mm -hmm. but then if you don't actively remain wise you don't remain a, like a, a student you don't have shiksha you don't remain a shisha this is a sanskrit term then your wisdom just stops there and you don't keep growing so we can use ai to get knowledge um, yeah, sorry, I was just bursting at the seams to just comment on those three things. <laughs> I hope that's all right, Tricia, sorry. I was just, oh, yeah, uh... no, that's totally fine. And, of course, what you're saying about um, being able to absorb knowledge from all aspects of life, because all life is a consequence of divinity, is so important. Um, it's, it's probably not wise to miss the little things and keep looking for something greater. We almost miss the point. Um, that's at least how I feel. But in your personal experience, now you've you've been part of the tradition for more than 40 years. Um, you've had an in-person spiritual master during this time. So you, you have a perspective uh, that's different to a lot of people. Now, going back to having technology and living in an intellectually driven society, um, how does one go about looking for an in-person guru? Or is it something you should wait for, something that will come to you when it's time? And also how skeptical should you be considering how many so-called gurus that are out there now and when it's so hard to um be tangible about certain aspects it's so much easier to get carried away it's harder for someone like me to be discerning so how how would you advise someone um to go about looking for an in-person guru and what value have you found from having someone in your life who can play that role Yes, excellent question. Uh, really important question. The two things I would say is understanding charisma versus character. Those two things are so, so important. Charisma is like, it comes from the Sanskrit word karishma, right? So it's like attractive, right? Charisma is attractive. Now someone could have charisma and no character. I'm sure people have come across people like that. In the end, they let you down right? So you do not want a guru that's very charismatic, but then has no substance because character is substance. There's one song that we sing every morning. Um, and one line is Veda Gya Yahara Charito, that the, the, the Vedas sing of the guru's character. 
And the word character comes from the, the Sanskrit word charitra, which also is the word chariot. So character is what carries you. Yeah, Charan means feet. So cha, this word char, character, this is what we want. We want someone with character. Now that goes for husband, wife, children, teacher, anyone you want, you want them to have character, right? So guru is the same. So if your guru has charisma and character, that's brilliant. But actually a lot of the times a guru, like I would say my own mother and father are my gurus. Yeah, so you have this Matra Deva Bhava, Pitra Deva Bhava, Acharya Deva Bhava. First you have culture, then you have knowledge. So mother and father generally give us culture. And I'm very, very fortunate. Now I can look back after, you know, being in my 40s to realize that actually my, my parents gave me culture. And then I was able to recognize that I need to look for substance, which is character. So that, that would be my short answer. I can go into, I know we're coming to the end of time, but I can really go into that uh, a lot more. But that would be the one thing is to look for character over charisma. Um, and, and that takes time. Don't be, don't do things cheaply. I'm sure Raj, you've got some, some things you might want to say about, about that as well. Well, Tricia, if you want to respond to what I've said, no. that's fine. No, I'd like to hear what Rajiv has to say um, on the matter. Um, yeah, I'll keep, I'll keep it short. So if you want to find a guru, you just, um, exactly what Balram said, three things, somebody who can, who uh, knows the way. Um, so somebody who, who, who can, you can ask the questions to and has the answers. Um, somebody that goes the way. So somebody that has the character, you actually, uh, you know, demonstrates that they're living, practicing what they preach. You know, so it's all good me, somebody saying, you know, yeah, you need to do this, wake up early in the morning, you need to meditate, you need to do this, that and the other. But actually, if they don't do it themselves, then it, it's not really going to, it's not going to really work. Or you're not going to see their character. Um, so somebody who, who who knows the way, who goes the way, and somebody who can show the way. So somebody that actually can um, show you, okay, Trisha or, you know, whoever else, like, okay for you i think this is the way and this is how you can achieve it and you know so they because they've experienced it themselves and and they can personally show you how to how to how to make that transition so yeah um, add, one, add one thing as well sorry i also like the idea of someone who's wise who's caring and who knows you so you have to spend that time to know each other because you might have someone who who knows you and they love you, but they're not wise. Mm -hmm. Or you have someone who's wise, but they don't know you. So they can mm -hmm. just give blanket advice and you don't really do it in the right way. So on top of what Raja said, then also these things are, they, they're, they're all ingredients to the search. Um, so that would be why I, mm -hmm. I would sprinkle, sprinkle on top of what, of what Raja said. <laughs> okay. So I'll just add one final question and I'll merge it with uh, the question we've got from Gaurav. So Gaurav's got um, an interesting anecdote about a movie. And the question really is that when we expose ourselves to something, and in this case, it's the Gita, um, our perspective changes. So we tend to see things in a certain light. Um, and he's used the term hallucinations. So implying that it's something outside of reality, something that we're cooking up in our minds. So to tie it back in with the gurus, um, maybe we've found a guru and then there's something we don't agree with, for example, or we find ourselves um, having a drastic shift in our perspective after starting a practice or reading the Gita, for example. How do we ensure that we are still being as discerning as possible? Um, and how would we know when it's just our confirmation bias or it's a figment of our imagination versus realizations of reality? Yeah, so, well, I'm doing a good one. <laughs> I'll let you carry on. I'll let you carry on because it is, we're short of time. So I'll, I'll let you 
if you've thought of something then. Um, yeah, like the thing is that when you when you have when you conduct spirituality, it's like looking at it from a lens. Uh, and it's described in Shastra that it's a clear lens. Like if you look at something with rose scented glasses, you see you see everything rosy. If you see something with black, you see black. If you see something with clear, then you then you see clear. So what Shastra does is it gives you perspective of reality. So it's not hiding things or it's not making things more different than they are. What it's giving you is a perspective of actually this is the truth. And what it does is when you connect with the truth or when you connect with these things and you identify what spirituality does or what um, the Shastra does, it actually moves you from uh, connecting with your identity, your soul, etc., and it moves you in that. It should move you in that positive direction. So it moves you in a direction where, you know, you see tangible things um, that you know are not that are better for you. So you know, we have in Gita like there's three modes of material nature: there's ignorance, passion, and goodness, and then beyond goodness. So then it describes things that these are things in the mode of ignorance that feel bad at the beginning and then are bad later on. Then there's things in the mode of passion. So you can experience that in your life. There's things that, you know, feel good, really good right now. Like, for example, a pizza or a, or a really nice cake feels good right now. But you know it's not but it's not really good for you in the long run. And then there's things that are good for you um, overall, which are, are maybe taste bitter at the beginning. But actually, in the long run, you're going to feel a lot better. So what uh, the what the Shastra does of the book, the, the spirituality is it moves you from along these things but it goes one step beyond goodness it goes to a point where actually you're connecting with the div divinity goodness is basically like getting to the airport you know like you have to drive to the airport to catch the plane so you, that's goodness so you get to the airport to catch the plane but once you get to goodness then you can connect with divinity so that's what that's what it does um Shira Prabhupada said uh who's 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 like a, a teacher or who are, who we who has written the Gita um that we reference and um it's like a little a, a funny thing but when he was asked by reporters he was like you know you're coming here Swamiji and you're like brainwashing everyone like what are you doing you're like brainwashing the kids here and she, he said she response was response was he goes yeah, I am. He goes, because everyone's brain was really dirty. So I've come here to wash, to brainwash them. So he took it like that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's cleansing our consciousness. That's my short answer. And I think Keshava Swami, or I think it was, who once gave the analogy of wiping the mirror or the windshield clean, like using your spiritual practice. And it's like having a dirty, dirty glass that you're looking through. Okay, so Rajiv, I think I will pass it on to you now for any concluding remarks. Thank you both so much for such an engaging discussion. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Over to you, Rajiv. Thank you, Trisha, for hosting this um, session so nicely and uh, and being such a great host. And, and I hope every... So maybe we can open up the chat how, and maybe you can just share how Trisha has been. It's her first time... Uh, coming on as as the host and i hope she's going to carry on as well uh through these wisdom talks um and uh yeah thank you also to balram for coming on as a, as a guest balram does a lot of work for us in the circles and leading some of the material and the content and he does also some amazing poetry so those of you who are interested in poetry like please um connect with us and um yeah and um yeah, we're looking forward to having these sessions regularly. So next week is Janmashmi. So we're doing an Instagram live. And then after that, there is the um, the talk uh, by Ed Noba on purpose. So the Bhagavad Gita on purpose, which is three weeks. And then at the end of September, we have something in person. So Trisha and the team will be sharing that with us, um, what topics we have and Maybe you can write to us and share what you want to hear more about, um, what's excited you, what do you want to engage us with, and uh, yeah, hopefully we can we can um, we can serve you in that way. And today is actually a day of Balram Jayanti, so maybe Balram, I'll let you close 
and maybe give us uh it's it's actually a day that marks the essence of guru which is why we talk, spoke this topic so maybe we can just end on that balram just maybe share a few words <laughs> wow okay put him on the spot but yeah so um well wow. spirit means to have breath in your lungs means to have life inside you so spiritual life is to feel very alive um I could, i've been watching uh, some of the screens here i've seen minnow cooking some rotis on there i've seen sushma smiling i've seen peer just chilling and listening so we hope that we have been beneficial to you in some sort of way we've been like the glass helping you see divinity in some sort of way um and hope we can continue serving you and yeah thank you trisha thank you raj for having me on here and hope to see you again soon that's all i can say thank you thank you everyone